Viper's Evolution, Chapter 2. The way I started to make the transition from person concerned and a liaison for safety between the general public and law enforcement was this next story. This one deals with a shooter that kept shooting a fully automatic rifle in the neighborhood. I called consistently, calling 911 again so often that the 911 operators would recognize my voice and say my name. They would say, Dale Brown, we have the, we know it's, you know, we know we got the call. Uh, we're sending officers as soon as possible. And uh, the full automatic rifle fire was very disruptive. When you're in a city and you start hearing gunshots, it's, it's different than hearing it on a gun range because it's so loud and there's so many buildings ricocheting, the tall buildings are ricocheting the sounds more than, you know, three or four times. So not only is it disruptive in general, hearing a 7.62 caliber assault rifle firing in, at full auto, but the buildings would amplify and continue the sound further uh, and giving it more resonance over a longer period of time. And I felt terrible for the families that lived there because I knew how disruptive and horrible it was for all these families. There's approximately 400 dwellings in this one square block of Holcomb, Agnes, East Jefferson, and Hibbard. And these buildings have families in them. Maybe 10% of the people there were criminals. 90% were just families working hard, trying to make a future for themselves and their children. And these terrorists, these individuals who were home invading, and in this case, uh, one of the first transitional stories from where I was just acting as a liaison to being more proactive uh, and in, uh, what I consider a proactive agent of change. This is one of those transitional stories. I call the police repeatedly. I, on the, let's see, I believe it was October 31st, the individual, instead of shooting once per day like he normally did, he was shooting full automatic all day, back to back. Finally, what I did is got into my vehicle and started listening, and every time we'd fire fully automatic, a full round of approximately 30 rounds, a 30-round magazine, I would just simply move closer to, the, to the, what I believe was the origin of the sound until finally I could see muzzle flash coming out of a house that is clearly occupied and going into what is clearly an unoccupied house. The unoccupied house, like many homes in Detroit, is just an abandoned house, and right next to it I see muzzle flash, full automatic, going right into the house. I'm very excited because I think, okay, this is exactly what we need. We need the information. We can simply call police and let them know what's going on. And now we can stop the families from ever hearing full automatic gunfire. There's lots of children around here that, that walk to school and live right in this general area. Uh, approximately 100 children. There's also a school that's approximately 150 yards from the origin of this gunfire. So I'm really excited because I found out where this gunfire is coming from. A, a, a thing that was common at that time, which has uh, subsequently died down, was that for, the, for three days around Halloween, there would be constant gunfire throughout Detroit. So that's why it was really hard for police to ever narrow it down. So I thought by me seeing the muzzle flash, I'd be able to help law enforcement, and therefore uh, help our citizens and our families not experience negative conditions. So I was so proud. I called 911, let them know I got the address. They said, well, we'll send a unit. I noticed an hour later there's still no unit. The guy's still shooting. Uh, I imagine he must have one magazine. He keeps reloading and firing, reloading and firing. But he must have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of rounds, because he continues firing throughout the day. Finally, I just take it upon myself to go to the police station. I go to 7th Precinct. They say go to 5th Precinct. I go to 5th Precinct. They said, okay, well, you know, we'll do what we can to send someone down. And I still called 911 again. Finally, I get back to uh, the corner of Holcomb and East Jefferson. There's a liquor store there. Uh, this, I, I look over and I see what's called the 30 Series, which is a police vehicle with four undercover officers in a red or burgundy um, Crown Victoria. So I thought that these officers were sent there specifically for this situation because it's some kind of specialized, you know, law enforcement unit. So I was excited. I walked over to the car and I said, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Dale Brown. Um, I'm the person who called about the gunfire. They said, excuse me? I said, yeah, right down the street, the um, automatic gunfire. And he said, 
Uh, well, you know, show us what you're talking about, and just kind of skipped right to that. So I still thought that basically these officers were sent specifically to answer to my issues, since I, you know, I called so much and went to the police stations physically in person. So I really thought that's you know clearly what they were doing there, and. Um, so we drove down the street. Now it's it's dark. So it just got dark. Barely, I mean, just literally happened while we're talking. So maybe it's um, October and it's now five, you know, five fifteen, and just got dark outside. So I pulled up. I'm so proud because I can I can see where the families are now going to have a decent you know way to sleep at night, not having gunshots and full automatic gunfire. It must be terrible where these families are, which are literally across the street from this from this um, location where he's been shooting all day long. And I drive up, I shine the spotlight right on the house. The police drive right past me approximately 150 uh, yards. When they drive past me, they pull over 150 yards up the street, maybe seven houses down to the right, and they pull over. So I pull away from the house, I turn my spotlight off, and I just simply pull down there by the police. The police officer says to me, uh, your truck says that you're a survival instructor. And I said, yes, sir. He says, um, listen, it's not very survival oriented for you to shine a spotlight on a home that has a gunman that you say is shooting fully automatic gunfire from. How was that survival oriented for you to do that? I said, well, sir, I understand your point, but I'm not here to survive at the expense of children and families in this area. That 7.62 caliber rifle can penetrate any of these buildings around here. And as a warrior and as a survivalist, I did not study my whole life how to survive and how to protect myself and others so that I could live while children are being killed. I said, I'm not here for that. I'm, I mean, when I, uh, as, as a warrior, I cannot expect, I cannot accept the fact that I'm sitting down there comfortable and down here, down the block, not in Afghanistan, not in some other country, but right down the block from me, Families are being terrorized, and I would rather die than know that I stood by and let these families suffer. And I made it a lot shorter than that, but the officer was like, well, you know, we see what you're, what, where you're talking about, and, uh, you know, we'll uh, pass on the information. Clearly, uh, he was not interested. Inside the vehicle, uh, there were four officers, one female, two males, uh, all African-American except for the driver, driver's Caucasian, um, and he was the sergeant. He was approximately, uh, I want to say, 45. At this time, I was 25 years old, and again, that was like in 1995. What I learned from this was that the law enforcement officers and I were different in that they were thinking about their long-term objectives, and I, all I was thinking about was family safety. These officers want to retire they want to do what's safe for themselves and and for their families, and I can respect that. However, I didn't have any of that. I didn't have any kids here, family here in Detroit, and I all I think I cared about was helping the people that I felt were terrorized in that area, and that's the area that I lived in. And I felt horrible growing up in the suburbs that kids had to grow up in these environments in the inner city, and I felt personally motivated to see to it that I do whatever I can to help these kids have the kind of life that I had where I never had to fear for anything under any conditions, really. I never knew the idea of, of assault rifle fire near my home where I was sleeping. And I don't think it's right these kids had to deal with that. And the kids in the inner city. And I, I really meant that I didn't care if I died as long as I know that I did my part to take away the terrorism from someone's life. And these kids deserve to have a terror-free existence.